Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. A new paper has been released by David Ian Lightbody in the Journal of Ancient Egyptian Architecture concerning the trial passages of Giza, long thought to be a test run for the building of the Great Pyramid. The new hypothesis by Lightbody gives a new purpose to the so-called trial passages, the chambers and corridors that were dug directly into the bedrock just east of the Great Pyramid. Lightbody claims that they could, in actual fact, be a place to observe the northern stars. In this video, I won't go into the detail that Lightbody has, but I will give you an outline of his arguments and findings. I've linked the full paper in the description below. So, what exactly are these trial passages? For those that don't know, I made a video about them two years ago, also linked below, and experts believe they were built around the same time as the Great Pyramid. The inclinations and dimensions of the passages are extremely similar to those of the Great Pyramid, and all on a north-south alignment. Flinders Petrie believed they were a trial version or replica of the internal passages of the Great Pyramid's descending passageway where it intersects with the ascending passageway, a way to see if the plugging mechanism in the Great Pyramid would work. But no granite plug blocks were found inside the trial passages, and there is also the problem of a tall vertical shaft at the junction of the ascending and descending passageways in the trial passages. Such a vertical shaft is apparently not there inside the Great Pyramid, so it is likely that the trial passages are not a replica of the Great Pyramid's internal shafts. Unless of course the pyramid architect changed his mind and decided not to incorporate the vertical shaft. Either that or the vertical shaft inside the Great Pyramid has still not been discovered. Some say that the trial passages were part of a smaller pyramid structure on the Giza Plateau, one that is not there today. And we have seen in previous videos, especially the writings of 18th century explorer Richard Pocock, that there were more smaller pyramids on the Giza Plateau that are no longer there. All of the ideas about the trial passages do seem to fall down in the detail, but now there is a new hypothesis that the trial passages were actually built to observe the circumpolar stars, something originally mentioned by Glenn Dash. Lightbody takes the idea a stage further and says that the passages were designed and intended to be used to establish an accurate astronomy-based north-south alignment for the construction of the Great Pyramid. We all know that the orientation of the Great Pyramid is incredibly accurate, with the sides only deviating by 1 15th of a single degree from the cardinal directions. Many authors have proposed how the ancient builders achieved this incredible accuracy, with some saying that the Egyptians used the stars that rotate around the northern celestial pole. Lightbody explores this idea in detail, and how the Great Pyramid architects could have actually used the trial passages to observe these northern polar stars over a prolonged period of time, to establish an accurate north-south referencing line for the construction of the Great Pyramid. Today, Polaris is half a degree from the Celestial North Pole, and in Old Kingdom times, there was no specific and exact polar star. Thuban or Alpha Draconis was the closest star to the North Pole during the Old Kingdom, and was around 1.5 degrees away. Therefore, to locate the exact Celestial North Pole, the Old Kingdom Egyptians would have had to track the circumpolar stars over a long period of time, something that they must have gotten right if the pyramids are accurately oriented to 1 15th of a single degree. For Lightbody to take his theory of the trial passages further, he created a 3D computer scale model that allowed perspective views from the simulated structure. He also used the Stellarium Digital Planetarium software to view the heavens during the Old Kingdom from the exact position of the trial passages. Lightbody highlighted the parts of the celestial polar region in the night sky that would have been visible from the trial passages, which was like a flat square of sky that would have been visible to the north. He then drew circles on the square patch of sky to track the movements of the circumpolar stars. His model was now set up. There are three openings from the trial passages to the surface of the Giza Plateau. The inclined northern sky shaft, the inclined southern access tunnel and the vertical shaft. 
So, how does the observatory work? Well, speaking simplistically, you would enter via the Southern Access Tunnel to the position where the two inclined passages intersect, directly below the vertical shaft, which would have had a plumb bob hanging down. Then you would travel southward, further down the Northern Sky Shaft. When inside the southern end of this shaft, you would look back up it towards the circumpolar sky. The whole observation mechanism is somewhat complicated and is best explained in Lightbody's paper. Shortly I'll give you a brief overview, but in layman's terms, by observing the sky from the trial passages, you would end up having two points marked out, one at the northern end of the passages and one directly under the vertical shaft. Then this information would need to be transmitted up onto the horizontal ground above to get a perfect north-south alignment. The further apart the two points are, the more accurate the north-south line would be, and for a structure as large as the Great Pyramid, the reference for the pyramid builders would certainly need to be accurate. To go into further detail, there would be a pole or obelisk at the northern end of the sky shaft, and as mentioned, there is a plumb bob that goes down the vertical shaft, extending from a horizontal wooden support at ground level. The blowing wind, as well as human or animal activity, could not affect the plumb bob inside the vertical shaft, and so any calculations would have always had good accuracy. So, looking up the sky shaft, and all of the circumpolar stars would be observable, as would the pole or obelisk at the northern end, as well as the hanging plumb bob. So, how does it work? How are you able to perfectly pinpoint the celestial north pole? Well, for a star you need to be acquainted with the movements of the stars, therefore astronomers would have made frequent sky observations. Calculations and observations would be made with the stars closest to the celestial pole, those that were visible all year round from inside the trial passages. Therefore, taking Thuban as an example, here is what happens. At the base of the vertical shaft, where the plumb bob hangs down, there will be two markers on a ruler, as shown here. The ruler would also be replicated above ground, and that is the need for the plumb bob. It means that any calculation made below could be exactly replicated above, all thanks to the plumb bob. This image shows how the Egyptians would record Thuban at its most easterly position in the night sky. The observer would line up the pole or obelisk with Thuban, and then move the left hand marker so it aligned with Thuban and the pole or obelisk. This image shows how they would record Thuban at its most westerly position in the night sky. The observer would once again line up the pole or obelisk with Thuban, and then move the right hand marker so that also aligned with Thuban and the pole or obelisk. This gives two marks on the ruler on the floor of the shaft. Then, the midpoint between these two markers records the exact position of the celestial pole in relation to the pole or obelisk at the northern end of the trial passages. In this diagram, this position is marked with a red line. From above, the plumb bob could be moved left or right so that it perfectly lines up with the red mark on the ruler. Once lined up, the point where the plumb bob now hangs from on the ground surface marks the celestial north pole in relation to the pole or obelisk at the northern end of the trial passages. Connect a rope or draw a line between these two points and you have a perfect north-south line on the surface of Giza. This whole process could be repeated with a number of circumpolar stars so that more measurements can be made. This would ensure that the results were correct and no human error has crept in. So that's the basic principle, and yes there could well be human error based on making the observations, but in theory it does work. And it is, in my opinion, a genius way to explain the trial passages. These calculations of a north-south line at the trial passages would then be extended and extrapolated laterally to set out the eastern edge of the Great Pyramid. Lightbody includes this fascinating little graph of the error in orientation to true north showing the different pyramid projects through time, according to the accepted timeline of pyramid building. Point 1 is the Step Pyramid of Josa, Point 2 is Maidum, 3 is the Bent Pyramid, 4 is the Red, 5 is the Great Pyramid, 6 Khafre, 7 Menkore, and 8 are the 5th Dynasty Pyramids of Sahur and Neferirkar. 
As you can see, the graph is in line with the quality of construction that has been noted with each pyramid project. Maybe a similar method of orientation was used for each pyramid project, and maybe the descending passageway in each pyramid was the first thing dug. And from this, calculations were made to ensure the edges of the pyramids were accurate. I don't know. Whatever the truth, the new work from Lightbody has certainly given me a great deal more to think about. This video is a convoluted and simplified look at the new paper, and I would urge you all to download it and read it in detail, because there is so much more information, diagrams and conclusions that have been drawn from the study. Before I end this video, I just want to tell you about the new membership function from YouTube. It allows people to support the Ancient Architects channel without having to set up a Patreon account. I've created some badges that will highlight your comments below the videos and I'll be able to give exclusive updates to members only. In the future, as I'm able to work ahead of myself, I'll allow members to get early access to each video I make. Just like with Patreon, the money will go to improving the channel, to future trips to ancient sites, and to allow me to spend the time researching new and exciting subjects for the Ancient Architects channel. Thank you for supporting me, I really appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.